ഏറ്റവും എന്താ ബയോഡൈവേഴ്സിറ്റി എന്ന വാക്ക് ആദ്യം ഉപയോഗിച്ചത് ഭൂമുഖത്തെ ജീവജാലങ്ങളും ആവാസ വ്യവസ്ഥകളും ഇന്ന് കടുത്ത ഭീഷണി നേരിടുന്നു എന്നുള്ളത് നമുക്കറിയാം അതിന് പല കാരണങ്ങളുണ്ട് ആഗോളതാപനമുണ്ട് വനനശീകരണമുണ്ട് കാലാവസ്ഥാ വ്യതിയാനമുണ്ട് മലിനീകരണമുണ്ട് ജൈവ അധിനിവേശമുണ്ട് ഇതെല്ലാം ഭീഷണിയുടെ ആഴം വർദ്ധിപ്പിക്കുകയാണ് പരിണാമ ശ്രേണിയിലെ അവസാന കണ്ണിയായ മനുഷ്യനെ നിലനിർത്തുന്നത് ജൈവ സമ്പത്താണ് ഭൂമിയെ ഒന്നാകെ ഒരു ആവാസ വ്യവസ്ഥയായി കരുതാമെങ്കിലും പ്രാദേശികമായി നിരവധി ഇക്കോ വ്യൂഹങ്ങൾ നിലനിൽക്കുന്നുണ്ട് അങ്ങനെ ഒരു ഇക്കോ വ്യൂഹമാണ് ഇന്ന് നമ്മൾ ചർച്ച ചെയ്യുന്ന ഭൂഗർഭത്തിലെ ഇക്കോ വ്യൂഹത്തെ പറ്റിയിട്ടുള്ള ഈ വെബിന ഡോക്ടർ രാജീവ് രാഘവൻ അവതരിപ്പിക്കുന്നു അപ്പൊ ജൈവ വൈവിധ്യത്താൽ സമ്പുഷ്ടമാണ് വയനാടൻ മലകൾ ഉൾപ്പെടുന്ന പശ്ചിമഘട്ട പ്രദേശം ഈ ജനിതക കലവറയുടെ പ്രാധാന്യം നമുക്കറിയാം മാധവ് ഗാഡ്ഗിലും കസ്തൂരി രംഗൻ റിപ്പോർട്ടുകളിലും പല പ്രാവശ്യം നമ്മൾ കേട്ടിട്ടുള്ളതാണ് അപ്പോൾ ജൈവ വൈവിധ്യ പരിസ്ഥിതി സംരക്ഷണ പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങൾ ഇനി ഏറ്റെടുക്കേണ്ടത് പുതിയ തലമുറയാണ് പുതിയ തലമുറയിലെ വിദ്യാർത്ഥികളാണ് പാരിസ്ഥിതിക ധാർമ്മികതയുടെ അവബോധം അവരിൽ പകരേണ്ടതുണ്ട് അത് അതിന് ഒരു സാധ്യതയായി തീരട്ടെ ഈ വെബിനാർ എന്ന് മാത്രം ആശംസിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് എന്റെ വാക്കുകൾ അവസാനിപ്പിക്കുന്നു ഡോക്ടർ രാജീവ് രാജീവ് രാഘവ് രാജീവ് രാജീവിനെ കുഫോസിലെ അസിസ്റ്റന്റ് പ്രൊഫസറായ രാജീവിനെ ഏറെ സ്നേഹത്തോടെയും ബഹുമാനത്തോടെയും അതിലേറെ സന്തോഷത്തോടെയും കൊല്ലം ശ്രീനാരായണ കോളേജിലെ അഗോറ വെബിനാർ സീരീസിലേക്ക് ഒരിക്കൽ കൂടി സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നു നിർത്തുന്നു നന്ദി നമസ്കാരം With great pleasure, I am introducing Dr. Rajiv Raghavan, today's speaker. Rajiv Raghavan is an assistant professor at the Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Science Studies, KUFOS, Kochi, Kerala, where his team studies fundamental and applied aspects of tropical aquatic biodiversity, focusing on taxonomy, molecular phylogenetics, evolutionary biogeography, and conservation. His research lab has been in the forefront of freshwater biodiversity documentations on the Indian subcontinent, having discovered and described 18 new species, three new genera, two enigmatic families of freshwater fish, and a unique new genus, and a species of blind subterranean shrimp. A new species of snakehead fish, Channa Rara, was recently named in honor of Rajiv for his contribution to theological research in the Western Kutz region. Since 2012, Rajiv has been closely involved with the work of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, and is currently the South Asia co-chair of the IUCN's Freshwater Fish Specialist Group, and also the IUCN's Freshwater Fish Red List Authority Coordinator for the continents of Asia and Oceania. Currently, he supervises four PhD and co-supervises an additional three students in various areas of freshwater and marine conservation, besides serving on the advisory committee of PhD and master's students from various universities in India and abroad. Rajiv has to credit more than 170 publications with more than 2,000 citations in top journals in the field of fishery science and biodiversity conservation. And he also serves on the editorial board of two leading international journals, Aquatic Conservation, Marine and Freshwater Ecosystems, Wiley Publications and Biodiversity and Conservation Springer. During his career, Rajiv has received prestigious fellowships from Erasmus Mundus Consortium, three times Third World Academy of Sciences and the Chinese Academy of Sciences and generated close to 2 million US dollars as grants from various international conservation agencies for his work on the freshwater fishes of the Western Hotspot. To me, he is a very down to earth person, very helpful, and what I say, a good friend. And heartfelt welcome to Dr. Rajiv Raghavan to the 18th session of our Agora 2021 webinar series organized by SN College Column. Over to Rajiv, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Disha. for that very kind uh, introduction and uh, for this uh, invitation to give uh, i hope i am audible 
Yes, sir. Oh, yes, okay. So, yeah. So, thank you for this uh, kind invitation. And, uh, you know, I, sh I think I should congratulate uh, Dr. Jisha and the rest of the uh, team behind uh, Agora for, uh, you know, organizing such a great uh, series. Uh, although I could not attend most of the talks, I have been seeing a lot of talks uh, covering very diverse areas, uh, including uh, science, environment, uh, social science, literature, humanities. So, it's a very uh, diverse uh, audience uh, as well. Uh, and uh, one of the most important things that uh, I could uh, make out from yesterday's introduction by the uh, principal was that he was saying that uh, more than uh, scientists and students, it is the common public and that have shown uh, interest in this talk series, which is extremely interesting and uh, only shows why we need more of uh, you know, uh, science communication, why scientists need to interact more with uh, the society and uh, so this uh, whole interaction between uh, science and society will be one of the uh, focal uh, themes of my uh, talk today and uh, both the common public and society will have a focus throughout my talk and you will know why the common public is most important to understand uh, the biodiversity of uh, the group of fishes that i'm going to talk to you about uh, today so i share my screen uh, Okay, so I hope the screen is visible. Full screen, full screen, sir. It is full okay, screen. Fine. fine, sir. Yeah, okay. So I, I think uh, many of you would uh, be curious to know why I kept a very unconventional slide to begin my talk today. So uh, as everyone would be familiar with this uh, structure, which is nothing but a, a dugout well, uh, which I'm sure is familiar to all of you here and uh, many of you who are listening uh, to this talk. So this well will be a common thread that will run throughout my uh, talk and this will keep uh, coming in most of my uh, slides uh, during this talk and you will know how and why uh, these wells are important uh, to study the group of fish uh, that I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, today. So uh, as the title uh, you know, suggests and you all know what the title is, uh, I'll be talking about a very uh, interesting, a very fascinating, but extremely poorly uh, studied and poorly known uh, group of uh, organisms, which uh, live very close to wherever all of you are, uh, in your homes, in your uh, nearby uh, adjoining landscapes, in the uh, plantations or farms behind your house, uh, etc. So you don't have to go uh, into remote uh, regions to understand and know and study about these uh, organisms. So uh, I'm sure everyone uh, listening to this talk will be uh, more or less familiar with this uh, landscape here, Western Guts. And uh, there was one uh, specific talk on the biodiversity of Western Guts uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Prasad a few uh, days, uh, a few weeks uh, ago. Uh, so this landscape is one of the most interesting, one of the most uh, biodiversity rich landscapes uh, in India. And uh, as far as the world uh, global biodiversity is concerned, it is one of the global biodiversity hotspots. I'm, I'm not going to details of the biodiversity significance because that has already been uh, covered in an earlier uh, talk. But I would like to go into the uh, aquatic system from the Western Guts. And as you can see, this is a drainage map of the uh, Western Guts. And you can see there is not even a single space without uh, a tributary or a distributary of a stream or a larger river. And the whole Western Ghats landscape uh, is one of the main watersheds of the country. Uh, it, cover, it drains almost 40% of uh, the Indian uh, land area. And so you will know why this uh, landscape is important from an aquatic uh, biodiversity uh, perspective. So more than biodiversity, it also uh, provides water to millions of people. It provides water for other ecosystem services like hydropower, irrigation, uh, you know, et cetera. So this is a typical uh, you know, image that one would uh, you know, be familiar with when we talk about Western Ghats uh, rivers, uh, Western Ghats uh, landscape, uh, very fast flowing uh, mountainous uh, streams, which are characteristic of this uh, Western Ghats biodiversity hotspot. And the type of fish that you get here are extremely diverse. It occupies every possible microhabitat in the uh, river system. 
right from you know waterfalls to uh, pools and riffles and all, or in any microhabitat you can think of there are fish that inhabit uh, these uh, microhabitats in the western ghats and they come in variety of shapes sizes uh, you know lots of uh, interesting uh, colors etc uh, for those who want to know a little bit more on uh, the uh, freshwater biodiversity or rather freshwater fish diversity of the western ghats we have uh, an extremely high uh, diversity here 330 plus uh, species uh, of which almost 70 percent are endemic which means they are not found anywhere else on this uh, planet so that makes the western guts an extremely important uh, biodiversity uh, landscape for freshwater fish uh, conservation and when most people talk about endemism they uh, limit endemism at the species level because you don't find a higher level endemism uh, frequently but in western guts the freshwater fish and this endemism is at the higher levels, uh, not only at the species level, but they're also at the generic level. We have 18 endemic genera, which are you know, found only in the Western Ghats. And most importantly, we have two endemic families of freshwater fish, which are uh, not known from any other, uh, such, such a small region, uh, nowhere else on this planet has two endemic families uh, you know, concentrated in a very small uh, uh, area of uh, land. But today I'm going to talk not about these uh, remote uh, uh, landscapes, mountainous streams, or uh, you know uh, these fish that live in them. But I'm going to talk about uh, an ecosystem that is very close to wherever we all live. Uh, an ecosystem that is right, uh, as my title suggested, right under under your feet or beneath your house or beneath the, the wells that you uh, you know take water from, uh, etc. So I'm going to talk about a very fascinating uh, group of fish that uh, lives very close to you, uh, but uh, which are not seen frequently and therefore which are not uh, studied or documented uh, in, in, in a way that it uh, needs to. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this peculiar uh, ecosystem beneath uh, the earth. Uh, and as the principal said, uh, we have uh, a very peculiar ecosystem beneath the earth which uh, is known by different names but basically this is a groundwater uh, you know ecosystem that fills the space between the rocks and the soil particles that you see uh, beneath the earth's surface so wherever you are beneath that uh, surface we have uh, a very uh, you know interesting uh, you know environment where uh, you know groundwater fills in the uh, spaces that are created by uh, soil uh, rocks uh, and other uh, particles so i'm going to talk about this uh, peculiar uh, environment uh, for my talk uh, today Right. So one, one would imagine what, what kind of uh, organisms would live in a very dark uh, environment uh, because more, there's no light. Uh, it's an extremely food scarce and environment, a uh, very harsh environment compared to uh, a river or a lake or any surface environment uh, for that matter. But then you have lots of interesting uh, fauna that you find here, including, you know, mycids, uh, isopods, uh, you know, amphipods. Uh, helminths, uh, uh, larvae of different uh, dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, there are also chironomid larvae, etc. So they are not really habitats where you don't get uh, anything. There are organisms, uh, but many people would think that the biodiversity would be restricted to uh, very small uh, organisms like this, uh, you know, insects and worms. But then uh, that is not the case. There is an extremely diverse, uh, uh, you know, extreme high, very extremely high diversity or biodiversity uh, as far as fishes are concerned uh, or fishes that live in these extremely harsh or uh, you know, uh, full scarce environments. We have lots of uh, species that are found in such groundwater systems uh, throughout the world. Again, like uh, in surface waters, they come in different uh, shapes, different sizes, uh, and uh, they're found all around the world. So they are known by different names. Uh, some people call them uh, cave fish. Uh, you know, if they are found in caves, and there are also other names like uh, troglomorphic, troglobitic, stegobitic, phreatic, uh, hypogean, uh, subterranean. But uh, most often, you find the uh, word subterranean used for all these kinds of uh, organisms that are found beneath the Earth's uh, surface, and that is what I will follow uh, throughout uh, this uh, talk as well. So as I already uh, mentioned, these are uh, dark, uh, very high stressful environments, uh, very little food is available there. And the fish that you find there are very peculiar. They have uh, you know, lots of adaptations because they live in such you know, harsh environments. 
they have uh, a combination of these uh, characters though it may be uh, characters that are reduced when compared to uh, the characters that you see on uh, surf in surface fish like uh, many uh, fish that live in subterranean waters do not have eyes they are blind they lack uh, pigmentation uh, when you compare them to surface water fish there are also very progressive characters like you know uh, overdeveloped uh, sensory structures because that helps them to find food uh, we also have fish that have elongated appendages uh, fin rays barbels that are you know far uh, longer and elongated than their uh, surface water uh, relatives the uh, organisms that live or fish that live in these environments are also having very low metabolic rates as uh, many studies have uh, you know even held subterranean fish in captivity for extended periods of starvation and uh, you know nothing has happened to them uh, most often many of these subterranean species are small on an average between 2 to 13 cm but uh, there is also the largest uh, cave fish in the world which stands at 43 uh, cm it's a cave uh, form of a cyprinid fish that we discovered last year from uh, the northeast uh, parts of india so uh, many of these uh, subterranean fish also have uh, phylogenetically or you know uh, a close sister species on in rivers and lakes or in surface waters and therefore most of most most of the time the subterranean fish are known as ghosts of uh, surface dwelling relatives because you know they, they all, already have a far more uh, you know advanced or uh, far more uh, you know a better uh, you know uh, colored or you know better uh, shaped uh, sibling uh, species uh, in the surface water environments so what what is the diversity and distribution of these subterranean fishes like they are found in 260 uh, there are 260 odd species in 36 countries uh, 25 families 78 genera uh, out of that 32 uh, genera are only found in subterranean systems china has the highest diversity of subterranean fish 50% uh, followed by brazil mexico and india so all these four countries together harbor almost 80% of the known uh, subterranean fishes from uh, the world and as far as india is concerned we have uh, 15 uh, species uh, which are found throughout india but uh, there is specific hot spots of diversity uh, there is a hot spot in northeast india there is one in central india and of course there is one in the western ghats uh, about which i will uh, talk in uh, detail so coming into the western ghats uh, we have an extremely high diversity of uh, subterranean fish that are the very unique very fascinating uh, species which have uh, attracted attention from uh, scientists and ecologists around the world uh, and i'll talk to you or i'll take you through uh, each of these groups in in detail but as you can see they again they come in uh, you know variety of uh, shapes sizes colors etc and uh, they also are represented by different uh, families orders uh, genera and uh, you know and and genera so it it all started in uh, uh 1944 uh, in, a, in a town called uh, kotem in in uh, south central kerala for those who are not from uh, this part of uh, india uh and uh, so this this story has a relation to uh, uh sn college in kollam who, who are organizing this uh, uh this talk series uh the story is that uh, one of your uh, very old uh, faculty members by the name uh, kr purushottam nair observed two pink colored fishes in the bottom mud taken out of his well uh, in kotem during his usual annual cleaning so in in kerala most uh, wells are cleaned uh, during the summer just before the rains and that happens frequently uh, in, in all the uh, play, all the homes that are wells and and so nair got interested uh, as these fishes were not common in wells and also because this uh, the fish that he got was extremely pink in color and it lacked eyes and as i said he was at that time a member of the staff of the zoology department who uh, are the organizers of this uh, uh, conference series and uh, he promptly deposited this uh, fish in the zoological museum of the, the college so your college where they remained for 5 uh, years so say from 1944 to 48 or 49 and uh, then the story goes that he uh, because he could not uh, do much work on these fish because they were very unique nobody knew what it was he transferred these fish to uh, his uh, friend uh, dr uh, krishna pillai who was uh, uh, an internationally acclaimed uh, you know, crustacean taxonomist who was based at the department of aquatic biology the then uh, department of aquatic biology at the university of kerala 
who also uh, she was basically a crustacean uh, taxonomist. He also did not have an idea of what this uh, this fish was, and therefore he sent uh, these specimens to the uh, Zoological uh, Survey of India, which uh, was the premier uh, zoological organization in the country. And it so happened that the scientists working at the Zoological Survey of India uh, described this fish uh, by themselves, but by honoring uh, Dr. Krishna Pillai's name. Uh, you know, the, the fish was described as Horaglanis krishnai, the specific or the species name was uh, in honor of uh, Dr. Krishna Pillai, who actually transferred these specimens to the uh, Zoological Survey of India. So this is what the, the description paper published in 1950 uh, looked like. Uh, it says on a remarkable blind uh, silurid, uh, which is a catfish of the family Claridae from Kerala. And uh, not much was known from the 1950s until uh, the 19, uh, eight, uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, when uh, you know a professor uh, by the name Dr. Anna Masi, who retired from uh, my university, the Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Studies, who worked for her PhD under Dr. Krishna Pillai, finally uh, decided to work on this group uh, of fish. So you know, uh, for 30 years, nothing was known, and then finally Dr. Uh, Anna Masi decided to work on this fish for her PhD, and this remains uh, until this date the most uh, exhaustive or comprehensive work uh, that has been done on this group of fish. So this is a snapshot of her PhD thesis, uh, which was published in 1981 from the Department of Aquatic Biology and Fisheries. And uh, uh, probably she is the first one to have uh, photographed uh, these fish uh, and, and or rather provided color photos of this uh, fascinating fish. So two additional species uh, within this genus was described uh, subsequently in uh, 2004 and, and 2012. They were given to, uh, you know, different names. They were from different parts of uh, Kerala as well. But they were all very similar to this uh, very blind, peculiar uh, catfish. And therefore, they were all placed under this uh, genus. So as part of uh, a project that I'm uh, recently carrying out uh, with the support of the uh, Directorate of Environment and Climate Change, uh, the Government of Kerala. We are comprehensively looking at the diversity and distribution of subterranean fishes of uh, the state, or rather the Western Ghats region. And as part of our work, we have uh, collected lots of uh, specimens and uh, we're doing different kinds of uh, you know, work on these fish, including uh, systematics, phylogenetics, uh, looking at their biogeography. And we're also working with colleagues who are studying their behavior uh, and other uh, aspects. So what we know now is that uh, this fish is found in uh, several districts of uh, Kerala, uh, primarily in uh, Trishur, Arnakulam, Idiki, Patanandata, Kottayam, and Alipi, uh, districts of uh, Kerala, where they are uh, occasionally uh, or in infrequently uh, found. So these are just uh, you know, uh, some of the very uh, interesting live images of uh, this uh, fish that you see, uh, which were photographed in a lab by my uh, students. So it's a very peculiar fish. As I said, it, it, is, it is, is blind, uh, and uh, therefore it has uh, attracted the attention of uh, fish uh, taxonomists and people from different uh, parts of the world. And this is uh, an osteological uh, preparation of uh, the same fish, uh, where we're trying to look at its uh, anatomy in detail and understand its uh, systematic and uh, phylogenetic uh, relationships by just not looking at this morphology, but also looking at different uh, aspects, including uh, you know, the uh, anatomy, uh, behavior, uh, phylogenetics, etc., molecular phylogenetics, uh, etc. So uh, that is fish number one. Uh, so we have another group, uh, not another group, but the same group uh, or the larger group known as catfishes. So this fish uh, was uh, discovered in uh, 2011, uh, and uh, this is again uh, this was again discovered from a well in uh, Trishur district of Kerala. And uh, as we can see from this um, you know, snapshot of the paper uh, which uh, which described this fish, you can see that the uh, authors who described this fish uh, knew that this was a catfish. Uh, they knew it was a, a new genus and a new species, but you can see the word incertisidis written there, which means uh, the authors could not place them under any known families of fish. So it, it was uh, of uh, you know, uncertain uh, placement. So they, they could not uh, place it uh, in, a, in a family or they did not understand what its uh, relationship with other families uh, was. So therefore, uh, this fish was uh, described, but uh, without uh, uh, giving or without assigning a family uh, to this uh, fish. 
so this is a peculiar uh, very peculiar looking um, subterranean fish uh, again you can see one of the main characters that you can see here is it lacks uh, a dorsal fin so there is no dorsal fin uh, for this fish but unlike it's uh, you know unlike horaglanis the fish that i talked about previously you can see that this fish has eyes uh, you know almost uh, you can say well developed eyes but there in some specimens there are also uh, small or subcutaneous eyes but one of the most remarkable character was the complete absence of uh, dorsal fin and also this uh, you know the confluence of uh, anal and uh, caudal fins you can see the anal and caudal fin are uh, you know uh, confluent or they are uh, together so there were lots of uh, interesting characters uh, for this fish so a, a few years later uh, one of my colleagues uh, dr binoy who will uh, give a talk uh, on a different topic uh, in the agora series next week or the week after that uh, he and his colleagues uh, by chance got uh, the same fish not from the wells but from uh, you know a paddy field uh, a channel of a paddy field the photo is there right uh, on the slide uh, so he was very uh, you know surprised because most people thought that this was a subterranean fish that are only found in wells but uh, you know he got this specimen from a paddy field and he published that saying you know cryptoglanis has both uh, hypogean and epigean relatives which means they are found both in subsurface or you know ground water and in uh, surface uh, waters so this is uh, that fish and what we did with colleagues is that we looked at its uh, anatomy in detail uh, and finally we uh, designated a new family for this fish called uh, cryptoglanidae uh, so this fish has only uh, this family has only one uh, species one genus it's a monotypic uh, family so uh, we had to look at its you know uh, osteology in detail and then compare it with all of the known catfish members of the known catfish families around the world and finally we uh, found that there are several remarkable characters that can easily be used to uh, erect a new family for this group of fish and uh, therefore we uh, designated a new family for this uh, fish Uh, so this is uh, a recent uh, habitat from where we got this fish. Uh, so we confirmed uh, Dr. Binoy's uh, observation that they are found in uh, surface waters also. So maybe they use both these habitats uh, for some uh, peculiar reason that we don't yet uh, know of. So there are also other groups of fish. So this one is uh, another uh, interesting group of fish. They are uh, you know, eels. So we can see from the uh, uh, illustration, they are snake-like uh, fish. Called eels, they're also you know, burrowing or uh, you know, fossorial forms. So there are uh, the first species was uh, described in 1951, again by uh, you know a staff, uh, uh, you know again by someone who uh, you know, worked at the Department of Aquatic uh, Biology and Fisheries, and uh, the holotype of this fish was deposited in, in the museum at the university. So there were uh, several papers followed describing uh, you know one or two uh, additional species. Uh, same kind of eels uh, from uh, different parts of uh, Kerala uh, in uh, uh, late 90s, uh, early 2000s. So there were uh, three or four additional species, and this is what uh, you know it looks like: a very slimy uh, eels. Uh, they look like snakes or worms to most people, and they are you know mistaken for you know worms or snakes. And uh, there are two different uh, forms of these uh, eels. One. Uh, is a completely blind form as you can see here uh, this does not have eyes this is a, a blind uh, eel and there's also uh, another uh, you know a group of eels that are uh, that have eyes and the basic difference is that the uh, blind eels uh, live uh, completely in subterranean systems under the ground whereas uh, the ones with uh, eyes uh, are uh, burrowing they do not live in surface waters per se but they live under the ground but not inside wells but mostly uh, in uh, burrow, burrowing inside paddy fields or you know wetlands so we did uh, different kinds of uh, you know molecular studies to look at the relationship between these uh, you know uh, groups and uh, so uh, for a matter of fact all these eels uh, until our study was uh, assigned to a, a single genus known as monopterus and if you look at uh, any book even now most of these books would carry the name monopterus for all these uh, eels uh, of the family symbranchidae they are that are found in uh, kerala and the western ghats but we looked at its uh, genetics uh, the molecular uh, you know, uh, characterization of these fish and we found out that the uh, the groups with eyes and the groups without eyes are completely uh, distinct uh, forms distinct uh, lineages that uh, required uh, different uh, genus names 
and we also found that this was different from the genus uh, known as monopterus and uh, you know into which all these uh, species were uh, earlier uh, assigned uh, to so therefore we uh, assigned or uh, we also looked at its uh, anatomy in detail uh, you know uh, using uh, ct scans uh, you know high definition ct scans with the help of colleagues from uh, the us uh, and uh, the uk and finally we uh, published this very uh, interesting paper recently where we gave the blind eels a new name uh, known as uh, rectomictus the genus was uh, given the new name uh, rectomictus uh, based on the uh, blood red coloration of uh, the fish uh, which uh, you know in the local uh, language malayalam is rectum and so uh, plus fish so this was uh, a name that was given to this group of fish uh, that are blind uh, the blind blood red eels that are uh, found in the uh, subterranean waters of uh, kerala So then, um, so that so we looked at two different groups, uh, catfishes and uh, eels. So they are the two most uh, conspicuous groups that you find in uh, subterranean uh, waters of uh, the Western Ghats. And uh, the third group I'm going to talk about is uh, a very peculiar group. So those who are familiar with freshwater fish would know the uh, group known as loaches which are mostly found in uh, mountain areas mountain streams uh, fast flowing rivers but we we uh, got a very remarkable uh, species of uh, uh, loach from uh, a very deep well uh, as you can see the photo and slide which uh, was very uh, peculiar for the fact that it did not have a dorsal fin uh, neither a pelvic fin and uh, you know it was a very small very miniature uh, fish that uh, you know was around two to three centimeters in size which was the first known uh, loach uh, under the genus Pangeo and that was described or discovered from a, a subterranean uh, system so this was very unique uh, finding that uh, you know we made in uh, you know 2019 and uh, so which means that our uh, understanding of uh, you know freshwater fish diversity in the subterranean systems are is far from uh, complete so as you can see this uh, the fish was again uh, like cryptoglanus uh, which was found from both the surface and subsurface or underground waters uh, the same way uh, this uh, peculiar loach was also found in both uh, wells and adjoining uh, ponds or ditches uh, very close to these uh, wells which means they do uh, travel from uh, one habitat to the other or they use these habitats for different reasons that we do not uh, right now know of so these are live images of uh, this uh, loach uh, the uh, the pangeo and uh, in interestingly we uh, named this uh, pangeo uh, bujia uh, because it looks uh, more or less like the uh, very uh, you know popular north indian snack uh, bujia save uh, very small tiny pieces of uh, you know any uh, fish a miniature fish so uh, this is about uh, uh, pangeo uh, bujia we also uh, had the opportunity or the luck to uh, discover uh, a blind uh, shrimp from these wells so it is not only really fish that live in these waters but also very interesting uh, crustaceans that live in these waters and as you can see this uh, there's a photo of uh, these crustaceans with eggs uh, you know in these uh, systems uh, so, the, uh, so there are also blind and non-blind, uh, you know, uh, crustaceans that live in these uh, wells. And uh, the blind one was uh, described as uh, new to science. It was not only a new uh, species, but it was also a new genus. Uh, we named it Eurindicus uh, bugarba, uh, a, a new genus and species. It was one of the first blind shrimp to be discovered from the Western Ghats uh, region, the Southern Western Ghats region. And also, uh, it had uh, you know a remarkable biogeographic uh, significance because this uh, family, uh, known as Uridae, a family, uh, was only known from Africa and South America, and this was the first uh, member of that family to be uh, known from uh, anywhere in Asia, for that matter. Which shows that uh, you know these are very ancient fish that have uh, their uh, you know lineages uh, dating back to the Gondwanan uh, supercontinent uh, several uh, million years uh, ago. So that was again another remarkable uh, finding from our team. So uh, what I'm going to tell you next is, uh, is a very quick story of one of the most remarkable discoveries of uh, freshwater fish uh, ever made in India for that matter. 
uh, and this all started um, with an image of a very bizarre looking uh, fish uh, that uh, you know uh, surfaced on social media in uh, you know early 2018 that uh, i got to see but uh, this was a photo that uh, you know, I got to see, but I could not uh, you know, get hold of specimens or I did not get any more information on this. But this, uh, to me, uh, looked like a very peculiar fish that I've never seen in my life, that I've never uh, you know, seen even in, in photographs or uh, images of fish from other parts of the world. And then I had to wait uh, several more months uh, until uh, this young uh, guy named Ajir uh, from uh, Malapuram district which is again in uh, central north or uh, rather north, northern uh, start of northern kerala uh, accidentally uh, found uh, again a peculiar looking fish from his paddy field uh, burrowing inside his paddy field which he then put up on social media which you know got to me and then you know uh, we uh, contacted uh, ajir uh, he was uh, extremely uh, happy to share his specimens uh, for research and uh, this uh, finally led to the uh, description of one of the most remarkable uh, snakehead fish uh, ever uh, described. And so this was the first ever known uh, snakehead species uh, from a subterranean uh, environment. And for those people who are familiar with fish, uh, you might know that snakeheads are very common fish that you find in uh, you know, rivers, lakes, uh, wetlands, paddy fields, etc. But uh, uh, no one actually... Uh, thought of a subterranean snakehead fish or a sna snakehead fish occurring in uh, subterranean uh, environments. But here it was uh, a very bizarre looking subterranean uh, species of snakehead. Again, it was a new genus and a new species, uh, which we named uh, Enigma Channa Golem, uh, an enigmatic snakehead. So that uh, was what Enigma Channa was all about. And Golem was uh, in, in uh, you know, for the, uh, the character uh, Golem in the Lord of the Rings, uh, which uh, is a character that lives under the ground. So this, the whole uh, story uh, was picked up by the uh, media, both national and international. So it was a splash all over the world. Uh, this discovery was hailed as one of the most remarkable discoveries of freshwater fish uh, in, in that year. As you see, we got a lot of uh, press attention from both local, national and uh, international uh, media. But uh, a few months later, there was a, a second a species of subterranean uh, snakehead uh, discovered uh, by colleagues from another institute in, in Cochin. Uh, and here, in this case, this was from a, a well. Uh, our specimens, as I said, were from uh, paddy fields. But this new remarkable second species of uh, subterranean snakehead uh, was from a well in uh, central Kerala near the town of Tiruvalla. So again, uh, very interesting uh, habitats, uh, wells and uh, wetlands where they bury uh, under the uh, mud. So we kept, uh, yeah, so this is a, a peculiar uh, or a rather not peculiar, but a common uh, habitat uh, of uh, the subterranean snakehead. Uh, you know, people residing in the rural landscapes of Kerala would be very familiar with this kind of habitat, a paddy field. Uh, you know, with uh, you know, lots of uh, wetlands uh, all around. So this is uh, the habitat from where we described uh, the Enigma Channa Golem uh, from. And uh, you can see that here, uh, this is my colleague from the Natural History Museum in London, who is now moved to Germany, uh, Ralph Britz, uh, one of the world's leading uh, fish taxonomists, actually looking at these uh, specimens in the night. And what was uh, surprising or peculiar was that uh, these fish, never came out during the time. So it was only after uh, 9 or 10 in the night that these fish came out into the uh, paddy fields and it was easy to spot them using a, a, a spotlight or a, a head torch. And you can see this is uh, an image of uh, the fish uh, right uh, when Ralph was looking into these uh, paddy fields. So it was uh, down here where you have this uh, photo uh, taken uh, from. So. Uh, this was the first probably live images of this uh, snakehead. And uh, as you can see from these images, they were extremely bizarre looking fish, extremely uh, fascinating, fantastic fish, which uh, was not like any other fish that was described or known from uh, Western girls in, or even India or even South Asia for that uh, matter. And we got lots of interesting images of this fish. Um, and uh, as you can see, these fish look like, uh, you know, dragons. Their movement uh, were uh, very similar to the movements of uh, dragons. And therefore, we named them uh, dragon uh, snakeheads. The name has hence, uh, you know, crept up into the uh, ichthyological uh, literature. And uh, this is a name that is now 
being used for this uh, group of uh, fish. So we kept uh, continuing our studies on this fish. We looked at uh, in detail into its anatomy, uh, high definition CT scan. So you can see CT scan of a skull of uh, an enigma charna golem here. Uh, we also did lots of interesting genetic studies, looked at its uh, mitogenomes. Uh, we sequenced lots of uh, mitochondrial and nuclear genes. And we uh, finally understood that uh, this fish uh, is not uh, or does not belong to the family of snakeheads, Sanidae. And this is an extremely old, very ancient uh, group of uh, fish related to snakeheads, which you know split from its ancestors way back in time, 130 million years ago, uh, very old lineage. And we had to, uh, then uh, we published a new paper uh, designating a new family for this, uh, this group of fish. We named them Enigma Sanidae. Uh, which was published in uh, Nature Scientific Reports uh, last year. And so this uh, extremely old uh, lineage, so 136 million years ago, means that they lived with uh, dinosaurs. So, you know, it is as old uh, as the dinosaurs. And this fish is an extremely old and extremely ancient uh, lineage with extremely interesting biogeographic uh, links. And again, this was picked up by lots of uh, media. So many call them uh, golem snakehead may have lived with the last, last dinosaurs. Uh, uh, we call them, or, or rather, both we and the media call them living fossils because they were, you know, very ancient lineages uh, sitting on the base of a phylogenetic tree, uh, 100 million old uh, fish. So it, it was an extremely interesting uh, discovery. And this is a snapshot of uh, the uh, National Geographic uh, magazine, uh, uh, which covered our uh, finding. So all this shows that there are still interesting fish to be discovered from uh, very uh, common habitats. As you can see, it was only from a paddy field and one uh, need not go to very remote forested habitats to uh, look at uh, or to find these interesting fish. So if you would have you know, carefully looked at uh, these slides, you would understand that they are either from wells or from uh, paddy fields, which are very common, uh, very obvious habitats that uh, are found just next door or uh, in your uh, compound or in your boundary of your home. So where are these fish uh, found? So there's a peculiar uh, soil type or a rock type in the Western Ghats known as laterite soil. So this red band that runs across in the map on this uh, right uh, uh, is uh, the map of laterite rocks. As you can see, it uh, runs right from the north to the southern tip of uh, Kerala or just uh, before the southern tip of uh, Kerala. And this is uh, a rock that is uh, known as laterite. Uh, the type locality of this rock, interestingly, is, is Kerala. Uh, it was uh, you know, first described in the 1800s by uh, Francis Hamilton, who also worked uh, on a lot of fish. So these are uh, the common uh, soil types that are found in, in Kerala. They are you know, permeable um, uh, rocks and soil types. As you can see, the small pores in these uh, rocks. And these are uh, found in on the sides of most of these wells. So most of these wells that I talked about are lateritic wells. Most of the areas from where these fish are found are all lateritic uh, regions in, in Kerala. And uh, these small pores help the uh, recharge and the movement of water uh, between uh, these wells. And uh, you know, it's just basically a semi-permeable uh, rock type that uh, recharges the aquifers and uh, the uh, wells for that matter. There are also lateritic caves uh, in, in uh, northern Kerala where we have worked. So this is an entrance to a lateritic uh, cave. Uh, again, uh, you know, very interesting habitat. So there's a student of mine photographing uh, organisms in small puddles of water in these lateritic caves. Again, this is the photo on the right. It's also uh, of a cave where you know, uh, we had to uh, crawl to uh, look at uh, organisms, uh, including fish and crustaceans. Uh, in northern uh, Kerala. So these are very uh, peculiar habitats uh, and uh, it is not very easy to get fish from these sub uh, subterranean or surface, subsurface water uh, environments, basically because uh, if you go to a, a river or a lake, you can throw a net or you can use a scoop net or for that matter, different kinds of nets to get these fish. But uh, collecting a fish from uh, a surface water or a subterranean system or groundwater is an extremely challenging uh, uh, say uh, a challenging uh, you know uh, lots of uh, techniques and methods that we have to uh, adapt we have to uh, uh, you know, what do you say uh, make or uh, fabricate 
to uh, collect fish from these uh, surface water bodies. So it is not really easy to collect uh, fish from uh, these uh, waters. One of the most common uh, methods that everyone has employed, uh, right from, so this is from Dr. Anna Mercy's thesis. So the way that she collected her uh, horaglanus catfishes in the late 70s and 80s was uh, you know, uh, asking people to drain wells. So there's a, a person who's actually uh, into the well on the right. So uh, he's looking at the mud on the uh, depths of these wells, actually agitating uh, these uh, waters to, and then the water is uh, taken out from the well. And then possibly we have uh, an opportunity to get uh, these fish. So that's one, one uh, method you can get. Uh, so this is the photo on the left is of uh, uh, my team member who is actually inside a well uh, trying to collect some uh, eels. So an extremely challenging and uh, difficult uh, collection uh, you know, method that we have to adopt to in order to get these fish. Uh, another uh, photo from a, a cave exploration that we made uh, several months ago in, in Northern Kerala. So these are very extreme habitats where collecting fish is not uh, really uh, easy. So you can see some of these uh, photos from our uh, caving uh, expedition. Lots of bats, lots of bat uh, guanos uh, in this. And you need uh, you know, extremely interesting, passionate uh, team members like this who can you know, crawl into small like, devices, into caves and uh, you know, get hold of uh, specimens. So these are very challenging uh, ways in which we have to work in order to get uh, specimens from these uh, systems. But if we are very lucky, we also have uh, an opportunity to find these fish right in your uh, kitchen or in your uh, you know, bathrooms. Uh, because most uh, of the times, or not most of the times, but uh, very rarely, uh, these fish slip out from the wells into an overhead storage tank and then they enter the, your uh, you know, uh, water uh, system and they come out uh, into taps. So look out for these uh, fish uh, once in a while. Uh, so these are also some uh, opportunities to collect uh, these interesting uh, uh, organisms. So uh, what happens to these uh, surface water? So are they uh, really safe? Uh, because we know that most of the freshwater habitats around the world, surface water habitats are extremely threatened uh, you know, by a lot of uh, anthropogenic stresses, uh, you know, pollution, there's alien fish, there's over harvest, uh, you know, lots of uh, uh, anthropogenic interventions that cause habitat loss. So altogether, there is a lot of uh, stress and pressure on uh, surface water systems. And similarly, the subterranean or subsurface waters are not uh, really different. Uh, any contamination, any any effect that you uh, have on the surface waters finally uh, you know, impacts the uh, the uh, the world below or the ground uh, below. And so sub subsurface waters and subterranean waters are heavily impacted by human uh, activities. Uh, so this is uh, a very highly cited paper that came out uh, several years ago, uh, which talked about uh, the Western Ghats uh, being uh, an important area where 81 million people are going to have insufficient water by the year 2050. So you can see the red mark there. So most of India, but also Western Ghats is one region where we will face an acute shortage of uh, drinking water, fresh water uh, by the year 2050. And almost 81 million people are predicted to have insufficient water. So this is the stress that we are, we are giving to the uh, you know, ground waters from where we take water for almost all our you know, daily uh, life or daily needs. India is one of the largest uh, extractors or rather users of groundwater in the world. Uh, uh, studies that say that 230 uh, cubic kilometers of uh, groundwater is extracted every year. And you can see the, the high levels of extremely high levels of extraction going on in different states. And uh, so this is uh, a major threat to the groundwater systems or the subterranean uh, systems, the extraction of uh, uh, groundwater or the indiscriminate extraction of uh, groundwater. We all know about the tragedy of the commons. Uh, so this is again a common uh, access and open access common pool resource where you know water is does not really belong to anyone. So it is uh, take as much as you want. And there's not uh, much management for groundwater uh, extraction in India. And as a result, this tragedy of the commons is uh, impacting uh, groundwater uh, resources and their use in India. And again, this is uh, going to be one of the most important threats to uh, subterranean habitats. So 
imagine if there's no management for uh, groundwater uh, that is used for humans what will be the impact of these uh, activities on uh, the poor little uh, organisms that are not seen or uh, not uh, you know studied by uh, us that live in these uh, subterranean uh, systems a very interesting map of uh, an intensive use of groundwater where UNT India is an outlier, an extremely high use of groundwater. Uh, this is from a paper published in 2012, where they showed that India uh, extracts you know, very, very high uh, quantities of uh, groundwater uh, and compared to other countries, you know, it's, it's an exorbitantly high uh, level. And you can see from this uh, map, it is pretty uh, obvious. So Kerala has the highest density of uh, wells, homestead dugout wells in, in India. It's one of the states which has the highest density of wells. Uh, almost 6.5 to 7 million wells are found in Kerala. And if you take uh, the highland and the midland areas of the state, between 70 to 150 wells are found in every square kilometer of uh, the state. So which shows you how uh, you know, uh, intensive uh, the groundwater extraction or uh, the water extraction through wells uh, happens in this part of the world. There's also other threats like uh, laterite mining. Laterite is used for a variety of purposes. These rocks are used for a variety of purposes, including uh, construction. So there's high levels of laterite, uh, laterite mining that happens throughout the states and also in adjacent states of uh, Kerala. Uh, there's absolutely no management uh, in, in place. So this is one threat. And uh, when people uh, dig more wells, it acts as more traps for these uh, subterranean uh, fish. So as I said, most of these uh, subterranean fish lives in the pores of these lateritic rocks, uh, which connect uh, different wells or you know, which are uh, you know, connected to these aquifers. But when you start building uh, or start digging uh, more wells, what happens is this is that these fish uh, you know accidentally come out or are forced to come out into uh, these wells and then they are you know either uh, uh, they come out through taps or uh, you know they are uh, killed when uh, wells are dug up uh, etc so new wells uh, means uh, there are more subterranean fish traps although it is good for research but uh, as we might get more uh, specimens but on the whole for the fish it is not so uh, good uh, wetlands uh, which help uh, recharge these aquifers are extremely highly polluted, uh, you know, extreme high levels of projection that uh, the uh, biological oxygen BOD uh, levels are going to extremely uh, high levels in, in the country uh, and especially in these wetlands that recharge these aquifers. So which means that uh, not only the uh, groundwater, but also the wetlands that recharge these uh, systems are also extremely polluted. Uh, there's also high levels of wetland and paddy field conversion. As we all know, uh, this is a, a common site across the state where uh, wetlands and paddy fields are converted for uh, construction uh, and uh, other uh, human uh, needs. And uh, probably these wetlands also harbor very interesting uh, burrowing uh, species and uh, types of uh, fish and crustaceans that are not yet uh, discovered. There's also uh, interesting uh, conflicts happening between humans and fish. So we all are familiar with human wildlife conflicts. Uh, there's lots of conflicts between elephants and humans in forested areas. There's lots of conflicts between tigers, leopards, and even monkeys and uh, several other uh, wildlife for that matter. But there is also a peculiar conflict of uh, these subterranean fish with humans because most people think that these fish are poisonous. Uh, when you find uh, the fish in these wells, uh, they stop drinking water from these wells. Uh, they call the nearest health authorities, thinking that the well is, uh, you know, toxic. Uh, the people may die. People may get lots of uh, you know, medical or health uh, issues, and they uh, kill them or uh, cull them uh, together, which is a very sad uh, situation. Uh, these are extremely harmless. These are extremely non-poisonous. Uh, you know, very shy. Uh, organisms which does not do anything uh, to humans and uh, what we have to understand that its uh, occurrence inside the water shows how good the water is and not otherwise uh, as many people uh, think so this is uh, an emerging uh, conflict uh, issue in uh, different parts of the state and what happens is then uh, many people uh, chlorinate or disinfect these wells uh, using uh, superchlorides and uh, this eventually leads to the, uh, the killing of all these uh, or death of all these uh, fish, not only these eels, but also uh, lots of <coughs> other uh, catfishes and uh, other uh, species that I talked to you about it in my previous slides. 
so uh, what do we uh, do now uh, we have very little knowledge as i said uh, nothing is known except uh, we know the name of the fish we know uh, some areas where they are uh, found but absolutely nothing is known about these uh, fish and most often uh, as i uh, talked about in my introduction uh, it is the local people the local common public the local communities who first happen to see these fish <laughs> it is not scientists like me or you know scientists who work on fish that happen to see these uh, fish uh, first but it is the common uh, people the people who live in these houses where the wells are situated where uh, these taps uh, you know bring in this fish etc who first see this fish and then they post it on uh, you know social media facebook uh, you know whatsapp etc and that is how we come to know about uh, these organisms so for any research on this species or this group of fish uh, we have to rely on the locals on the local communities to in order to uh, get us specimens in order to understand uh, the distribution of these fish uh, etc so they play a very uh, critical role small boys like this who uh, often uh, get these fish uh, from their wells or from their taps keep them and uh, you know when we go and ask them for the fish they are you know very reluctant uh, to give us this fish because you know they keep them as pets but then most of them you know we make them understand the importance of this fish and you know important is uh, this fish for research etc and then you know uh, slightly uh, you know they are in a better uh, you know uh, psychological condition or mood to give us uh, this fish so uh, kids uh, local kids local people are extremely important uh, talking to them is extremely important uh, because many people have seen this fish many people uh, think that they are worms they are snakes and many people have accidentally thrown these fish out because they are not uh, interesting etc so uh, getting information from locals is uh, extremely important so this is uh, Uh, a house from where uh, we get uh, you know, some training fish, and these are my team members. You know, photographing this fish, and we have a kid who actually kept uh, these fish uh, at this uh, uh, in in bottles, who also uh, was interestingly looking at what uh, we are doing. So, uh, for those who are interested in uh, doing research on this uh, group of fish, uh, lots and lots and lots of uh, research opportunities. As I said, absolutely nothing is known. we don't yet know how many species are found we as i said do not have a good sampling strategy uh, sampling technique that works across habitats we are now uh, working on uh, standardizing uh, environmental dna techniques to look at uh, diversity and distribution of uh, these organisms we are also working on genomes uh, whole genomes look at their phylogenetics and biogeography in detail uh, there's absolutely nothing known on its diet on their reproduction on their migration why do they use different habitats why do they use both surface and subsurface habitats why do they use wells and wetlands so lots of research questions are still uh, unaddressed which uh, you know students who are interested researchers who are interested you know there are lots of interesting questions to work on this fish for the next 10 20 years or even more uh, we can also use uh, predictive uh, models species distribution models to predict distributions we can also uh, look at how climate change would impact these organisms we need to understand how uh, stress and threats uh, impact this uh, fish how chemical stress in, uh, uh, interacts with these organisms how does digging of wells interact how does ground water extraction uh, interact so lots of uh, impacts need to be understood uh, the behavior uh, so this is something that my colleague uh, binoy who i said will give a talk later uh, in, in the week or the next uh, who works at the national institute of advanced studies in bangalore Uh, is actually is a, a cognitive uh, behavioral ecologist who works on uh, fish behavior and he is also trying to uh, understand uh, some uh, behavioral uh, patterns and behavioral uh, you know, the ethology of these uh, interesting uh, fish so uh, before i end i would like to uh, ask all of you uh, who are attending this talk to actually to keep an eye out for these uh, very fascinating interesting uh, fish because they occur in some of the most uh, common habitats where we don't really look for uh, fish uh, most often as uh, fish taxonomist or other aquatic biologist we all have a tendency to look for fish in very remote habitats we you know travel for you know hundreds of kilometers you know trek for days into you know mountainous streams very remote habitats to look for interesting fish to discover new fish but then you have uh, very common habitats like wetlands paddy fields wells in your home which are home to a remarkable diversity of fish as i already showed you and uh, i'm sure we have only reached the tip of the iceberg and we have lots and lots of interesting fish 
to be discovered from uh, these uh, systems. So make sure that every one of you who lives in these landscapes who have uh, access to such uh, ecosystems, keep uh, an eye out for these uh, interesting uh, fish. So as you can see, they are even found in small uh, ditches and ponds, which uh, one may think that no fish would ever be found there, but we have found uh, you know, remarkable uh, subterranean organisms in, in our fish in these uh, small, uh, even uh, very uh, you know, uh, polluted, uh, rather, so you can see plastic bottles thrown all over on the left side. So, but we, it still has lots of interesting fish. Another uh, you know, place where you can look at uh, your overhead storage tanks in your home, if they are connected to wells, uh, because that is a place where uh, fish can uh, get into and they you know, live in these overhead storage tanks. So this is a photo of my uh, team members looking at overhead storage tanks from where, uh, in fact, we have uh, been lucky to get uh, several uh, fish. Uh, so with this, I would uh, say uh, thank you for your uh, patient hearing. And uh, this is, uh, as I said, I started with a well and I end with uh, a well. Uh, this is one of the most important habitats from where we get uh, lots of interesting uh, subterranean fish. And these are habitats that should be uh, protected. Uh, and as I said, uh, please do not uh, kill or uh, think that fish uh, however strange they would uh, look like, maybe they look like worms, maybe they look like snakes, maybe they don't have eyes, maybe they don't have fins. In any strange organism that you get from these wells, it only shows how good these wells are. Uh, do not uh, kill them. Uh, do not uh, you know, uh, heavily chlorinate or you know, heavily disinfect the wells if you find them, uh, because they are extremely uh, you know, interesting uh, a species that we uh, Indians or Keralaites should be proud of because they are not found anywhere else on this entire uh, planet. And uh, the small piece of land on the southwest coast of India is the only home to many of these uh, fish. So uh, I would also like to say uh, that um, almost 99% of all this work has been done by my students, my team members and my colleagues. Uh, and so uh, every one of them uh, requires uh, you know, acknowledgement, appreciation, and without uh, the entire uh, team uh, here and the lots of funding agencies and collaborators uh, with whom we work, uh, this work uh, would not have materialized and we would not have been able to uh, improve uh, our knowledge on these uh, organisms. So, you know, uh, all the uh, merit uh, should go to this uh, entire group of uh, team members who support us. And uh, finally, uh, if uh, there are people who, I'm sure there are people from uh, many different districts of uh, Kerala who are listening to this talk, and this is an appeal to uh, every uh, participant here that uh, I've given names of districts here, uh, right from Kasargod, Kannur, Kodikod, Malapuram, Trishur, Ernavalam, Idiki, Kotaim, Kollam, Patranthita, Alipi, Thiruvandam. So all of these districts are districts from where we have collected or we know that subterranean organisms or subterranean fish crustaceans are uh, present. We also have reports of uh, subterranean uh, fish uh, and crustaceans occurring uh, just north of uh, Kerala, just north of Kasargod into Mangalore and uh, the rest of uh, Dakshin Kannada uh, districts, uh, Udupi and the nearby areas. So if you are from those areas and if you ever happen to find uh, any of these interesting uh, fish, please let us know. Uh, please uh, send us a photograph or, you know, if, uh, you know, it is not possible to send uh, a fish or a specimen. We would be extremely happy to come over uh, and uh, you know, work with you guys uh, to uh, uh, do more uh, research on these uh, fish. So if you could just note down these numbers. So we're also on active on social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, email, uh, phone. Uh, we also have a website. So you can contact us uh, in any uh, manner. Uh, so please do keep uh, a lookout for these extremely interesting organisms because that can not only um, tell us a lot about uh, you know, biology, but it can also tell us a lot about the history of our region, the, uh, the biogeography of, your, of our region, and then rather the natural history of the Western Ghats and the uh, state of Kerala. So with that, I would end my talk. So thank you so much for uh, listening. And if you have any uh, questions, I would be happy to uh, take them. Thank you. Thank you, Raju, sir, for your awesome talk and beautiful photographs. I would like to supplement some points on Purushottam and Nair, sir. You have mentioned yes. in the first slides. Uh, 
I think uh, he documented first the subterranean fishes from Kerala firstly. I mean, uh, I have talked uh, uh, to Dr. Apukutan sir today, or he was uh, our first bus student during 1964. Purushottam sir was an, uh, in charge of SN College Marine Station, uh, which was situated at Tangasheri coastal area at Poland Town. And later on, uh, his uh, building was relocated to our own campus in the town. Anyway, thank you, Rajiv sir, for mentioning his name, and we will definitely edit our department history with no, this think, great person's name. No, I think thank it, you, sir. It, it, it should be documented in your uh, no, reports and records because that definitely. is for the first time, uh, as I said, uh, a blind subterranean fish was ever discovered. Uh, in, in India, and I think he should be given credit uh, for that discovery, although uh, he was not given that credit that he deserved. So, yeah. Thank you, sir. And we can move to a question and an answer session. Could you see it? Yes. So, uh, do I read them or uh, how, how does it go? Should I read them or? Shall I read or you no, can? No, no, it, it is up to I, I can also read an answer. So the first okay, one, right, yeah. Right. So, um, so we've identified several species which are blind. Uh, rather, they possess eyes which are rudimentary and has no vision. Since they occur in natural habitat, I want to know how they escape from the natural predators. Okay, so this is an interesting question. Uh, we really don't have any idea about uh, their uh, you know behavior in the wild. As I said, the only information that we have are from uh, specimens uh, most most often dead specimens that we get or from uh, specimens that uh, we get live and we have uh, only worked on their uh, taxonomy and the systematics and so on. But I think uh, as I showed in one of the slides, uh, some of these species have extremely uh, you know, progressive characters, including uh, sensory pores, uh, you know, uh, extremely elongated barbels, etc., which probably would serve as uh, defense mechanisms and would help them uh, to avoid predators, etc. So they would definitely uh, have uh, adaptive uh, characters, which uh, are uh, peculiar to these uh, organisms, but which we don't really know of how they do this in the wild because we nobody has ever documented them in the wild uh, because they are uh, habitats that are not really accessible. Although we are trying using uh, you know underwater cameras and uh, things like that, uh, we don't. We are not uh, in a position to uh, give or provide much uh, information on how they do this uh, in the wild. So uh, yeah. So then, lost vision in fish is heritable. Uh, yes. So there are also uh, you know species uh, of. Uh, no, so one of the examples I showed is this uh, blind eel, uh, which also have uh, species in uh, very similar species, which have eyes, which do not have eyes. But in the same species, uh, at least in the Western Ghats, we uh, do not have species which uh, have eyes and do not have eyes. So there are two different genus within the same family, but uh, I think uh, it is a heritable character and almost all of these species have uh, either are blind or not uh, blind. Uh, the talk is very interesting, informative, and colorful. Thank you. Does the application of fertilizer affect a biodiversity of subterranean fish in paddy fields? Obviously, it would. Again, as I said uh, in one of the slides where I showed the future research opportunities, uh, these are opportunities where we would need to uh, look at these uh, questions in detail. Right now, we do not have any idea about how uh, any human stress uh, impacts uh, these uh, organisms. Uh, but I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, fertilizers and uh, their impacts uh, would definitely be a cause for uh, concern, uh, especially since these uh, organisms are uh, very uh, you know, uh, uh, small in numbers and uh, it will definitely have uh, an effect on them in the uh, long term. Uh, Dr. Abhilash says, uh, hearty appreciations to you and your team. May I know the relevance of environmental DNA analysis in the study of subterranean fish? Okay, so... Uh, that's a good question because uh, one of the uh, most uh, important uh, uses of environmental DNA is, uh, of course, as you know, non-invasive uh, method of uh, you know, uh, understanding diversity and distribution. So uh, most often what happens is uh, we have wells, as I showed you, we have wetlands where the fish may or may not be found. 
and unless we get them in chance encounters either through traps or uh, well uh, during the cleaning of wells we have no idea whether the fish is found there or not many wells have fish many wells do not have uh, fish so what we are trying to do is to uh, understand if the fish is found in in a well by looking at the water uh, or the well water by uh, you know uh, amplifying dna out of this water through this environmental dna uh, procedure and uh, understanding uh, how many wells would have the presence of these uh, organisms and how many would not uh, or how many do not have so this is a fairly easy way uh, easy in the sense once the environmental dna protocol is standardized so we have already started to work on that we have already standardized uh, you know primers and uh, you know barcodes for many uh, species we are yet to start with the water uh, part of the uh, whole uh, study but with that it will be a fairly easy uh, and fairly uh, you know less trouble uh, you know uh, strategy of uh, understanding uh, diversity and distribution rather than uh, cleaning wells rather than asking someone to go inside wells uh, of course we will not have uh, samples but we will understand uh, where these uh, fish are found and you know uh, the distribution uh, can be better mapped so that's one uh, way uh, environmental dna would definitely help in this study is there a possibility for harboring parasites in this fish yes so this is something that many uh, people have uh, asked me especially uh, people who study parasites or parasite all this we have not yet uh, seen any parasites on this fish but uh, uh, i'm sure that there are lots of uh, parasites which are found on subterranean fish in other parts of the world because uh, there are lots of papers which have documented uh, parasites in uh, cave fish in subterranean fish and i'm sure this is again an interesting uh, opportunity so as i said most of our focus in the lab is uh, very fundamental things like uh, taxonomy systematics phylogenetics and if there is someone who is interested in working on these uh, parasites uh, more than welcome we'll be happy to uh, you know collaborate uh, you know share our uh, specimens or uh, you know get you along uh, for uh, working on these uh, or working on the parasitology of uh, these interesting uh, organisms ecological importance as far as we know uh, i think they're good the indicators of water quality as i said uh, most of these wells uh, where they are found uh, you know are uh, good uh, you know uh, or what do i say the water in these wells are of uh, extremely good uh, quality and uh, so i think it would definitely be a good uh, candidate for an ecological indicator in these wells and uh, aquifers but other than that we really do not have much idea about what are the other ecological roles that these uh, fish play basically because we are unable to study them in the wild and uh, as i already told you they are you know inaccessible they are you know extremely uh, you know rare to find or maybe they're not rare in their natural habitats but they are rare uh, once we start uh, collecting them or once we you know want uh, specimens uh, what are the applications of e uh, dna so i already uh, briefed about environmental dna and i'm sure that would answer most of your uh, questions uh do these fish grow in size and uh, reproduce yes so um, uh, so many uh, fish are uh, having different uh, size ranges from 2 to uh, you know 15 or uh, even 20 25 cm uh, if you look at those big large sized eels they are extremely uh, long and if you uh, would have uh, carefully looked at one of my slides which i can uh, share once again uh there was a slide here yes so uh, is the slide visible yes sir okay so one second i'll just go to the slide where yeah so this one so if you can see the fish on the right it has ripe eggs and the fish is only 2 uh, cm uh, in in its length so which means that they are sexually uh, maturing at a very small uh, size to 2 cm is a sexually mature you know, fish as you can see the entire you know pot of eggs uh, in uh, that fish so uh, i hope the photo is visible yes sir yeah okay thank you yeah. guruji yeah so you can see the eggs on that uh, photograph so so that would answer that question on whether these fish grow in size and reproduce yes so they do uh, reproduce but we do not 
uh, have uh, or uh, rather we have not yet um, seen or collected uh, larvae or uh, you know, young uh, juveniles of uh, this fish. But uh, certainly this evidence that the fish uh, matures and uh, has eggs definitely is an indicator that uh, of course reproduction is going on in these uh, systems. Uh, whether you have any fish from the Surangas and Kasagod, you should take water from the Surangas. Uh, we have uh, some uh, specimens from uh, Kasargod, yes, but they are mostly eels. So, yes, we do have uh, specimens from uh, the uh, Surangas at uh, Kasargod. Uh, so, the minimum size and maximum size of these subterranean fish, uh, as I said, uh, you know, uh, two centimeters, 1.5 to two centimeters, the smallest. And then when you talk about eels, 20 to 25 centimeters uh, are you know very large yields that you find in the west so it's it's between that it depends on which species uh, which uh, genus we are looking at do these fish have any other light sensing organs additional adaptation most of them are blind uh, we do not yet know about any of these uh, you know, anatomical uh, structures light sensing organs yet but uh, additional adaptations yes they do uh, the sensory pores, the pore structure on most of these blind fish are extremely advanced. So most of these uh, fish have an extremely advanced pores on their uh, you know, uh, nasal pores or you know sensory pores on their near the mouth or near the nose, etc. By which they do uh, sense uh, prey, uh, you know, probably as a predator uh, defense mechanism and, and, and so on. We don't know whether there are any predators in these systems, but yes. So most there are lots of adaptations, uh, you know, other additional adaptations which they uh, use instead of uh, the ice, which a normal fish would have. How can we conserve freshwater fishes with limited power of dispersal, low reproductive rate, and short life cycle in the fragmented habitats of western Uh That is also an interesting question. So I'm I'm not really sure whether you are talking about uh, subterranean fish or you know surface water fish in the Western Ghats, but either way, I think uh, it has to be through a combination of uh, techniques uh, involving uh, the common uh, public, as I said, especially with regard to subterranean fish, local communities, common public, small kids are the first to uh, actually uh, come in contact with these uh, species. It is not the scientists. So unless, uh, so only they know where these fish are found, and so it is up to them to protect these habitats, make sure that they do not uh, pollute, or uh, they do not uh, use these habitats for other purposes, they do not reclaim these habitats uh, for uh, you know, household, uh, you know, for building houses or for you know, other uh, anthropogenic uh, uses. So uh, finally, I think it all uh, comes down to uh, local level uh, interventions, uh, local level conservation actions which the local people have to do because uh, the conservation cannot be done with a forced uh, mindset. So there are several rules, but unless people uh, really enforce them voluntarily, it is very difficult, especially uh, for these fish, because most of these fish are not found in forests where there are people to protect them, uh, like the national parks or wildlife sanctuaries or you know, things like that. But these are found right in your home, you know, found right uh, you know, behind your house in the paddy fields or in, say, the wells. So unless it is uh, an approach, a voluntary approach from the locals who have access to these systems, I think it is very difficult to uh, conserve this in the uh, long term. Uh, another question is, do, you, do they have any particular anatomy of their heart compared to other pelagic fish? I have absolutely no idea. We have not really looked at the uh, you know, anatomy of the heart or any of those things. Uh, so I am unable to give you more uh, information on uh, that part of this fish. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. As you said, the ecology of these species are not fully studied. What do you think they eat on? Okay, so this is an interesting question. Uh, again, most of the information that we have is only uh, indirect evidence, as I can say, because uh, as we know, these wells, uh, as I showed in one of the, one of my slides, have uh, some uh, prey which includes mycids, uh, helminth worms. Uh, 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 isopods and amphipods, etc. Uh, there is also a studies by Dr. Namasi which says that uh, there are chironomid larvae in these habitats. Uh, there are uh, you know, uh, nymphs, a nymph of uh, damselflies and dragonflies inside these wells. So although we have not got, so this is documented in her thesis, 
So I think they eat on uh, many of these uh, small uh, you know, organisms. And uh, once they uh, are uh, in captivity in, in our lab, they do take uh, you know live feed like you know moina or atemia or even small pieces of crustaceans. Uh, many many species are very picky. They are very choose. Uh, they do very uh, you know, they choose on what they eat. But uh, some eels uh, do take uh, most of the live uh, animal matter that are uh, provided. As you mentioned about the largest cave fish from India, what is its name? The fish is also is the fish blind. Okay, so the cave largest cave fish from India is a species of uh, cypernid fish. For those who are familiar with cypernids, it is the uh, group that carps belong to. This largest cave fish in India is uh, a species of masir, uh, which is uh, of the genus Tor. And uh, there is no name for this fish, uh, which is interesting uh, because. Uh, all what we know right now uh, that uh, is, it is a species of masir. Uh, we are currently working on uh, more aspects of this fish, including its uh, you know anatomy, its uh, molecular phylogenetics, etc. And we will uh, uh, probably uh, come out with a paper in the next uh, few months uh, describing this fish and giving it a name. So right now, uh, all we know is it is uh, a species of masir. And of course, it is blind. Yes, so if it's blind, they are found in caves in uh, Meghalaya. Uh, so that's uh, if I have time after the questions, I'll show you one or two slides of this cave. So I did keep it as uh, a reserve uh, in case I don't have uh, time. So next one is a compliment. Thank you very much for the informative talk. Thank you. What whether there are schools of fish in this environment? Yes, uh, schools. Yes, for. Uh, Eels, as you would have seen from one of the uh, slide where I did mention about the human fish conflict, you would have seen the number of eels that are present uh, in uh, a single bucket. Uh, so all of those eels are from a, a single well. And uh, we have uh, documents saying that, uh, you know, probably people have got hundreds of eels from a single well. So eels do uh, occur in large groups in these wells. But uh, for the other uh, species like uh, horoglanus and cryptoglanus, not much. So hardly we get one or two uh, specimens from uh, a well. So it is not, uh, I, I don't think they are uh, schooling in that uh, sense. But maybe this is a question that you can ask uh, Dr. Binoy when he gives his talk on uh, cognition and behavior of uh, this. Next one. Thank you, sir. Very interesting topic. Thank you very much. So I think uh, those are the only questions. Since are over, I think. I don't see any other questions in the Q&A. Yeah. Uh, any questions from panelists? Dr. Sorna? Beno, sir? Sorna Cheshi? No response. Hello, Rajiv. Uh, nothing, Jisha. Actually, it was a wonderful presentation by Rajiv. Uh, no, actually, I want to know whether you have done any, um, I think, one or two, how many specimens did you get for Enigma Chen today? For Enigma Chen, we have lots of specimens now. Uh, so, first, have you gone only... through uh, feeding or breeding biology? No, so there is a friend of mine who actually uh, is keeping them live in, in Bangalore. Okay. So, he okay. tries to understand the biology. So, if uh, Dr. Nisha can just give me one or two minutes more, I can just show you one slide. If, if, Anyone wants to have a look of a live uh, Enigma Channa in uh, one of my friends' uh, fish tanks. Dr. Disha, can I just share the screen for a minute if somebody's interested? Yeah, sure, sir. Okay. So, for video, I am not sure whether it will work, but I will try to. Uh, what about the fecundity? Do they fecund more or less? No idea. Absolutely no idea. Okay. So don't have any idea about any of those uh, things. Do they show any kind of parental care or anything like that? Not that we know of because hmm. we have not uh, kept any of these fish uh, live to understand what, uh, what behavior they show. So this is uh, one video. Uh, of a peculiar, uh, you know, maybe uh, I don't know what kind of behavior this is, but uh, something that my friend uh, documented of 
enigma channa two enigma channa fighting with each other in in this tank okay maybe it is a ter territorial fight or something yeah. like that we yeah. absolutely mm -hmm. but they do show lots of interesting uh, behavioral uh, mm -hmm. pattern mm -hmm. yeah. so what do what do you uh, feed uh, feed them so as you can see there was a small shrimp running around uh, okay so they are omnivores or yeah, carnivores so you can see the right in the middle yeah so okay, okay. yeah so most, most of them take only live feed so they are very picky they are they take only live uh, food but mm -hmm. uh, my friend is trying to uh, you know wean them to commercial uh, diets and to see if they respond to uh, commercially available uh, carnivorous fish feeds mm -hmm. so that is something right but right now it is only shrimp or uh, earthworms or other uh, you know, live uh, food is there any way to identify their sex without uh, dissection no no chance yeah, again, i don't think so okay we need to need to understand okay okay thank you thank you so much thank you jisha thank you hari sir ah uh, hello rajiv yes. excellent work thank you congratulations thank you then uh, i think uh, the work is in the a preliminary taxonomic yes. systematics level yes. yeah yes. Very, very, uh, lot very to come a uh, lot to come you opened a very uh, a large area to be studied and you have to maintain a network of uh, citizen scientist i think that will be able to uh, supplement more in this collection of specimen is very uh, herculean task so you need to maintain a, a network of uh, citizen as well as uh, scholars uh research scholars etc and i think a lot of biological work and behavioral studies need to be studied but the availability of specimen is the inference to for these studies i think so so keep it up very 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 uh, nice area and uh, I, i have one question that all the specimens may possess are there possess any lateral line system or something like that no 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 it does not huh? they are not possess what about scales do you yes, have yes. any uh, uh, catfishes they don't for aglanism cryptoglanis they don't okay but uh, pangeo they have scales loaches they, they have scales yes. okay okay what type of scales uh, do you uh, not uh, look at what not and quite okay okay something. but they possess they possess scales yes, they possess scales yes. okay okay thank you so the uh upcoming uh thesis i think uh, you cover all these things okay uh, yes okay all the best ajay okay. thank you nice to meet you yes, in agora platform okay any anyone from panelists joining the session i think there's one more question that i have not answered uh one it's last one uh, the last one uh, it's smith yeah does the presence of such rare specimens suggest the tectonic movement of plates so that you could relate to similar species existing in other continents or other parts of the world yes so uh, this is an interesting question so we are uh, that is what we are trying to do now we are uh, studying its biogeography and understanding what uh, it Uh, relationship with other uh, members of the same order or same family in other parts of the world are for example in uh, enigma channa uh, i showed you the uh, phylogenetic tree which uh, showed that uh, 130 million years ago the fish had diverged from its ancestors in africa so uh, it was basically uh, an african indian connection that was uh, revealed uh, as part of our uh, you know phylogenetic and biogeographic studies and although very preliminary uh, the relationship of this blind uh, catfish horaglanis is said to be with uh, another blind catfish that occurs in uh, eastern africa uh, uh, in in somalia so although that has not been tested using uh, you know either uh, you know phylogenetic or anatomical evidence this is just a speculation that was uh, given when the fish was described because no other blind catfish was found uh, during that time so the only blind catfish that was known was from east africa but uh, i am sure there would be very interesting connections between 
the western judge uh, species and those species living in either uh, africa mostly in africa because we speculate that all of these are gondwanan uh, relics so which means they've all originated on the gondwana supercontinent and they would have then uh, traveled to either uh, you know africa or to uh, the indian uh, plates when the indian plates hit the uh, you know uh, eurasian uh, continent so what whatever information we have right now points to a gondwanan uh, relationship of all these uh, very a unique uh, subterranean organisms so uh, i also told you about that blind shrimp so the only relatives of those blind shrimp are either in africa or south america which uh, obviously tells us that there is some uh, relationship between uh, western guts uh, subterranean fish and those living in africa or uh, south america but mostly it is an african connection mostly it is a gondwanan uh, connection